Hello guys and welcome to my channel. My name is Stefan Passion, also known as Invencia. And this time around I'm going to be making the most basic Unity tutorial that I will ever make. If you're brand new to Unity or even if you want to brush up on your basic skills or if you want to write your first C-sharp script, even though it's a very basic one, uh, this is a video just for you. I've been using Unity for over eight years now. I've uh, created a lot of assets that I sell in the asset store and I create a lot of uh, small games, especially uh, for Ludum Dare, for example. I've done 11 consecutive Ludum Dare games where you have to make a game from scratch in only 48 hours. So, and currently I'm working on a multiplayer RTS game with a colleague of mine and uh, we're one year into development. I'll be announcing that later on during this year. So again, sit back, uh, have a cup of coffee, a can of Coke, uh, even a cup of tea if that's what you want. And let's just get started with the most basic Unity tutorial ever. So I've downloaded the most recent version of Unity that's available at the moment, 2019.4. And when you start that one, you might get this Unity hub up. I've got a lot of Unity versions installed since I work with a lot of assets, so uh, you should hopefully not have this many. First, I'm going to use this little drop down here to ensure that it's the version of Unity that I want. And I want the most recent one that I've downloaded yesterday, 2019.4.4 F1. So it should look pretty much the same in any version of Unity that you've downloaded if it's uh, fairly recent. And then I'm going to make a 3D project here and we're going to just uh, name it something like Unity Basics and then I'll hit create. Okay, so I normally use the professional skin, but I've reverted back to the basic skin now. So it should hopefully look very similar to this with the color scheme and everything like that if uh, you're not running the Plus or Pro version yourself. And I've also reset to make sure I've got the default view. So the layout of the screen should be pretty much identical if you've started a brand new copy of Unity. First, let's cover the user interface a little bit here in part one. And uh, in the center here, you have something called the scene view. And uh, imagine yourself that you're a director of a film so basically what the scene view is, is everything including the stage, but you also have the cameras, the lights, uh, maybe some actors uh, off stage a little bit that are about to come in in just a moment. Uh, so that's the scene view. Basically you see everything that uh, will make up your game. And this is actually where you're going to be designing your game as well. On this second tab here, you have the game window, and that's basically what the camera sees. So imagine that as if you were in, in a theater, for example, in a movie theater, and you were looking at the big screen, and whatever goes on on that screen, that's the game view. Or for in, in our case, it's going to be the player that's playing the game. Whatever the camera sees or what the player should see is what is going to be visible in this game view. And you can see that by default here, it's got this sky box with a blue sky and a horizon. And if we look in the scene view, we can see that it's actually this little camera here that's uh, looking at something. And as you can see here, the camera itself and the light is not visible. They're just showing the scene and lighting the scene. On the left here, you have something called a hierarchy, and that's basically like an inventory list. So of everything that's in your scene. So they're very linked together. The scene view has a lot of stuff with icons and items, and the hierarchy is a list of that view. And it's a collapsible list. You can collapse and expand a few of these things here. As you can see, you've got the main camera, which is the same as here, and the directional light. If you click on something here, it'll also select it in the scene view. So if you click on it in the hierarchy, it will select it in the scene view as well. You can arrange things up and down here by selecting something and dragging it and dropping it above and below this list. And normally it doesn't really have that much of an impact for your game. But if you're making a user interface or if you're making a 2D game, the order will make a difference uh, because it's rendering in the layer from top to bottom. But if you've got, for example, a UI, it will render from the top and down. So if you have a lot of boxes or windows that are on top of each other, it'll render them in that order. So it's going to be the one that's furthest down that's going to be the one that's on top. But in a 3D viewport like this, like in our game, we're not going to be needing to sort any of this because the sorting is taking care of the camera and the distance that objects have from the camera. So in this hierarchy view, you will have a lot of stuff for your game. For example, you'll have, uh, if you're making a platformer, you'll have a, a list of a bunch of tiles and you'll have your player, the weapon that he's carrying, all the enemies that he can encounter. And they'll also be showing somewhere in the scene. You could also instantiate stuff during the runtime. We won't really be doing that this time. Because uh, when you make a very simple game, you can basically throw everything into the scene and have it active at all the time. But when you're making more and more complex games, you'll want to have uh, stuff to be created and removed dynamically. But again, that's uh, for a later video. Down at the bottom here, you have something called a project window. And by default, it's split into two parts. You've got the left uh, sort of a folder view here. And on the right, you'll have a bunch of icons. And it's very empty at the moment. I usually use this little drop down to do a one column layout sometimes. Uh, but the default view is two columns and that's what I'll be using now. Think of the project folder as a warehouse, for example. Again, if we're making a movie uh, and you're the director and you want to make it, that film, 
the warehouse or the project window is where you'll have all the stuff that's stashed away for later use. Maybe it's stuff for your next scene or a future level. Maybe it's those tiles covered in snow or uh, the next uh, boss that you'll encounter uh, a few levels down the line. And then finally in the UI here we have on the right side something called the inspector. And uh, when you have something selected in the scene or uh, in the hierarchy here, whichever, then you'll have a bunch of stuff for that object that you've selected in this inspector. Just think of it as a magnifying glass that zooms in on an object and you can change some values here for example, you can type in different values, you can drag some sliders, use the drop downs buttons, and you can add and remove things. We'll go through that in, in a lot more detail in just a moment. So that's the inspector and you'll be using that one a lot. We're going to be talking about game objects, transforms and components. And those terms are very common in Unity. Let's start by creating a game object. I'm going to right click now here in the hierarchy and we're going to create uh, something called, uh, let's create a 3D object and let's make it a cube. And this is one of the primitive that comes with Unity by default. And it's created a little cube, we can see it here in the hierarchy, but we can also see it here in the scene view. What we've just created now is called a game object and everything in Unity is a game object. This camera is a game object, this light is a game object, and this cube that we've just created is also a game object. And a game object is a collection of stuff like something called a transform and a lot of components that we can add to this game object. Not only did it appear here in the scene and in our little inventory hierarchy list here, but it also appeared in the game view because we happen to create it in the center of the scene and we've got a camera that's looking at that one. And the game view will automatically update as you make changes to your game. If we even select this camera here, you get a little preview down here in the lower right corner and you can see that it's, uh, even though it's a little bit faint, you can see that it's uh, actually looking at this cube. And Unity's coordinate system is working on uh, XYZ where Z is forward and that's the blue arrow here. And the camera is always looking forward in the forward direction. And as you can see here, the camera is looking at this cube and we see it in the preview and we see it here in the game view itself. We can rotate the view here. If we hold the Alt key and then the left mouse button, we can rotate around in the scene view here as we edit. We'll need to be able to rotate and see stuff from different angles when we wanna place things or modify things. And that has no impact on the game itself. As you can see, when I rotate here, the camera is still looking forward in its own direction and it's looking at that cube. Also in the UI that I haven't covered yet is in the top left here you have a little toolbar and you've got stuff like a move tool for example, you've got the rotate tool and a scale tool. You can also toggle these with the keyboard. So W is this move tool, E is the rotation tool and R is scaling tool. So if you're coming from the world of Blender where I do a lot of my work, then it's not the same keys. So it's just a a brain melt, uh, but you'll get used to it in the end. You just have to adjust a little bit and then rethink it. If we press W now, or we click this little move tool here, you can see that you get this uh, arrow gizmo on the, on the game object. And if I slide it here, you can see that the camera is moving forward and we'll get closer to this cube here. And I can slide it back and we can go up and down. And also if I press E or select this rotate tool, we can rotate it on an axis. So we rotate the camera in different angles. But let's move that one back to the default location. We can press Ctrl Z a few times and the camera is back to its default location here. And then we can also select the cube instead, either by clicking it here, or we could have also clicked on the cube itself here in the scene view. And in the same way here, you can move it up and down, left and right, and position it where you want it in your game world. I remember that we talked about this inspector thing on the right here. And as you can see, when I drag this object here, it updates the position. So if I go up, it changes the Y coordinates. And if I go down, it changes it down. We can also just click here and press zero, click, press zero and zero. So we can type in values there if we want an exact positioning there. So what is a transform anyway? A transform is the position, rotation and scale of a game object. Every game object will have a transform in your game. And again, it's the position, rotation and scale of that game object. And by default, uh, the scale is always one. And that's what you should try to operate at most times. Uh, you get better performance if stuff is scaled uh, one and you also have uh, less problems if you have a hierarchy of game objects. If they're scaled differently, <laughs> it'll get a little bit confusing with the scales. And we can also see a few other things here in this specter. And when you create this default game object or the cube, uh, not only did it add this transform automatically, it also has a bunch of components here. It's got something called a mesh filter and this is telling the graphics card what type of a mesh it should be rendering. And in this case, it's a cube. If I click on this little button here, you can see that I can select a few different meshes here. 
And these are the default primitives that come with Unity. And later on, when you make your game, you'll probably import 3D objects from Blender or something like that. And if you do that, then they will also show up here. So the mesh filter tells the graphics card which mesh it should be rendering. Then we have something called the mesh render, and that's actually responsible to telling the graphics card how to render this mesh. It knows that it's a cube, but we can also assign it stuff like a material, and it's got a default material here by default. How we should be interacting with the shadows. Should it be casting shadows? Should it be receiving shadows? We've got stuff like probes and stuff like that. We don't have to worry about that. That's a bit of a future thing. And we also have this thing called a, a box collider. And a collider is uh, telling the physics engine how it should be interacting or how it should be colliding with other objects in your scene. <laughs> and by default, it also gets this uh, box collider automatically. So in this inspector here, what we just covered now are different components that are attached to this game object. If it looks a bit confusing, don't worry too much about it now, because uh, as you start making your own games and prototypes with Unity, uh, this sort of stuff will come to you through the process. Uh, you'll repeat it over and over again, and it'll start... <laughs> making its way into your brain. So again, don't worry about it too much. Come back to this video if you need it in the future as well. And you can go through this back and forth, but you'll learn this as you make your own games. Don't worry about it. Now let's rename this cube. Uh, we should make something uh, that resembles a little bit of a game. So I can uh, click on it here. You can either rename it up here by typing it in here. Hello. And that changed it here in the hierarchy as well. And you can also click on it here and press F2 to rename it. And we're going to make uh, something that could be uh, the start of a platforming game. So let's call this one Floor Tile. So that's the start of our platforming game. Uh, let's press play and see if it's a fun game. It automatically switches us to the game view. That's what happens when you press play. But it's not much of a fun game yet. And technically, it's not even a game because uh, a game requires uh, some form of user input. And it should also be some uh, challenges that you need to overcome. And uh, you should be rewarded for overcoming those challenges. And we haven't done any of those. So let's press the play button again to stop this. OK, since we call this cube a floor tile, we should make it look a little bit more like a floor tile from a platforming game. So we're going to create our first material now to change the color. And down here in the project, let's make sure we have the assets folder selected here. And in the empty space here, let's right click and create a new folder. We want to keep things tidy. So let's name this one materials. I usually create folders like this and I put materials in one folder so I know where to find them. And we can double click on this folder now and let's right click again now and create something else. Let's make it a material this time. So we're going to name this one floor dirt because this is going to be the brown part of our tile. We want to change the color of this. We don't want gray dirt. So on the right here, when I've got this uh, floor dirt material selected, on the right here, we still have the inspector. And as you can see, that can work here as well. Not only when you select stuff in your scene, but also when you select stuff in your warehouse or in your project folder, you can modify those. So let's change the color here from white of this material. So let's change it to a brown dirt color. We can see a little preview down here at the bottom and dirt rarely shines unless you've polished it. So let's drink the Drink. Let's bring this uh, smoothness slider down and you can see that the shininess disappeared. It's still getting lit and it has some shadow, but it's not shining anymore. Don't polish it third. Okay, so now we need to move this floor dirt material. We'll click on it and drag it onto the cube here. You can either do it onto the one up here or straight into the scene. Let's drop it on the cube here in the scene since we can see it. And if I select the floor tile now, you can actually see that it replaced this material here, um, the first element, to floor dirt. We dragged it onto there, but you could technically drag it onto there, or you could have dragged it onto there. There's many ways to do it. So pick your weapon of choice. <laughs> okay, so a little bit more about the navigation. So I mentioned before that in the scene view, we can hold Alt and then click the left mouse button to rotate around the view. You can also hold the shift key down and press your middle mouse button to pan around in your scene. And you can use the scroll wheel to zoom in and out. And sometimes you get a little bit off centered like this. And when you start rotating, it's rotating way out of <laughs> what you want to be watching. And if you have, if you select the floor tile here and then press F, it will frame it into view. That's very useful as well. And now we can, uh, when we rotate around it, it nicely orbits around our object. So remember, the F key will focus onto a game object. Same thing, if I select the camera, press F, then it centers on that one. So let's go back to our floor tile now. F, zoom out a little bit, and here we go. All right, now we're gonna make it look a little bit more, again, like a floor tile in a platforming game. So uh, we can actually select this uh, game object that we already have selected. <laughs> and then I press Control D. 
and that created a copy of it here. And we can't really see anything different here in the scene view because it created a copy in the exact same location. But let's rename this first of all. We'll click on it here in the hierarchy, press F2, and let's just name it grass. And then we also need to make a grass material. So let's click down here in the project view. We click our floor dirt material, press Control D, and it's created a copy here. So let's press F2 and name it grass. And then we should change this as well. Make sure that it's selected. And then we click on the albedo color up here and make it green, green like grass. Okay, there we go. And now uh, it's it'll be tricky to move it onto here because we don't know the we've got two game objects now with the same type of the cube and in the same location. So we don't necessarily know which object we're dragging onto here. So here's a good example where you want to drag it onto your grass here instead. And again, it. It showed it, it probably would have hit the right object, but we don't know that for sure. But now we know that it was the grass tile. So if I select the grass here, we can see that it's got the grass um, material. And here the floor tile has got the floor dirt. But they're in the exact same location. So let's make sure we've got the grass selected here and then slide it up a little bit on this axis. And now you can see something called Z fighting. Z fighting is when the graphic card is trying to render surfaces that are exactly in the same location on the one plane then it doesn't really know which one to pick, so it just does its best job. And here we can see that sometimes it's picking the dirt and sometimes it's picking the grass to render. And this is a bit of a problem, but we can work around that for now. Let's start by sending it up to make sure we've got it. Uh, we can type here in the inspector 0 0.5, and now we know that we raise the grass up to half the distance here. The, the cubes in Unity by default are one by one by one units, and we've raised it now on the Y axis, which is up by 0 0.5. And now we can also change the scale here. Let's make the X scale 1.01. .01. And you can see that the Z fighting just disappeared here. And we'll do the same on the Z axis here, 1.01. .01. And now since uh, that cube, the grass cube is slightly, slightly bigger, it only has to be a little bit bigger, then the graphics card has enough precision now to not have to let them fight. But it's a bit thick, the grass, so we have to mow this a little bit. Let's change the Y scale here to 0 0.1. And that compresses this uh, cube down into a flat grass texture. And now it starts to look a little bit like a floor tile in a platforming game. I mentioned before that you should try to avoid changing the scale. But for this purpose, if you're going to create primitive game objects like this using the primitive cubes, you don't really have any options. You have to change the scale. But you want to avoid changing the scale if you're designing your game objects or your meshes in Blender, for example. Try to model them in the scale that they will be using in the game engine because it will save you a lot of time and hassle later on. So the floor tile and the grass, they're two different game objects. So if I move this floor tile here, you can see that the grass stays there. And we don't really want that to happen. Uh, the same way if we move the grass here, just the grass moves. So we can actually change the hierarchy. That's why, again, why it's called a hierarchy window here, because I can pick this grass now, I click on it, I hold it, and I drag it onto the floor tile. And that made the grass game object a child of the floor tile object. I can still move the grass independently, like this. Control Z, let's move it back. But if I click on the floor tile and move it, then this grass is a child, and then it will follow its parent around. So that's very useful. You'll often have big hierarchies in a game object. For example, if you've got a spaceship, you'll have maybe wings, you'll have weapons as children, uh, you'll have turrets, flames, thrusters, you name it. But again, still both are game objects with its own set of components. So keep that in mind. Also, the in the inspector here now that we can see that to transform, if we select this floor tile, it's showing the position. And this happens to be the position in the world because this is the root object. It's placed at the very top of our hierarchy here. So whatever value it says here in the position for this transform is the world position. So when we centered it to 0, 0, 0 here, it's in the center of our world. This is in relation to its parent. So if I move this floor tile to the side here, let's change the position here on the x-axis. When I click the grass now, guess what? It'll still say 0. And then we've shift, shifted it up on the Y position, but X that we changed for the parent is still zero. And that's because the child is showing here in the inspector its relative position to the parent. All right, think of it like this. I'm a parent, I've got a bunch of kids. And uh, for example, when they were younger, I used to carry them in my arms. So they were in a relative position to me. They were zero, zero, zero centimeters from me in an X, Y, Z coordinate system. But I could walk around in the house. I could go up the stairs down. I could change my position, but my child's position relative to me was in the same location. If I held my child out like this, maybe one meter, if I've got long enough arms from myself, then the relative position from me is one meter in my Z direction, in my forward direction. <laughs> and then, for example, let's say there was a strange sound coming from this baby, uh, something really strange, and then it started to stink. 
then I can reparent this child object to another parent, and then the problem pretty much goes away. It takes care of itself that way. So think of it like that if you're having struggles now with the local coordinate system, maybe that'll help. Okay, now we're going to talk about prefabs, and prefabs are prefabricated game objects, and that's something you should really consider using. Uh, pretty much every game will be using prefabs that you make, and it'll save you a lot of time and hassle, so try to make sure that you grasp the concept of this. Let's go back to the project folder here, and let's make sure we go to the root here in the assets, and let's right click here and create a new folder again, and let's call this one prefabs. Remember, let's keep it tidy now. We can double click to get into this folder, and if I drag this floor tile now, I just click on it in the hierarchy and then drag it into this folder. We've created our first prefab. That's how simple it is. And you can see up here, uh, it turned blue now, the floor tile and the child. And that's how Unity will tell you that uh, this is actually a prefab that you've got. Let's drag this prefab now that we've created from the project folder, from our warehouse, into the scene. And we can instantiate or create this uh, prefab or an instance of this prefab now in our scene. And since uh, the game is working in a three-dimensional space and our monitors only show two dimensions, it could be a little bit difficult to place this. It does help you a little bit, because if you hit a collider, it will actually try to align it to that collider, as you can see. So that can help you sometimes when you position it. But let's just drop it anywhere in the scene now, and it's automatically selected it for us, and let's just ma manually change this position. Maybe we'll put it to x equals 3, 0, 0 and rotate. Okay, let's make a smaller gap. Let's just put it at position 2 here. We've got two game objects now, but they're based on the same prefab here. You can actually duplicate the objects here straight in your scene as well. If I have this one selected now, I press Control D here in the scene view, and I, if I hold the Control key and slide it, it'll actually snap it nicely in the coordinate system here. Uh, and we could s snap move it to uh, X location 3 here. And now we've got three prefab instances here. And Unity will know that it was a prefab that you copied when we pressed Control D here, so it's still using. You can see that it's still blue here, and all of these three game objects now and their children are using this prefab that we've created earlier. We want to keep things tidy, as I mentioned before, and we can see that in the hierarchy now we've started to mess things up a little bit. It's starting to look a little bit uh, messy, so we can we can fix that. Let's right-click here in the hierarchy and create a new empty game object. We'll press F2 and let's rename it to Level. And uh, we can also manually, I like to keep all my objects uh, that are placeholders or folder objects to 000 in the scene because then the children of that one will have the same coordinate that it will show in its transform will be the same as the world position. If your level object here is a little bit offset, it'll look a bit strange. So keep that in mind. Try to keep these uh, folder objects to 000 in your scene. And then I can click on these, and then I can hold the control key and multi-select these objects here, and then we can drag them into the hierarchy of the level. And the beautiful thing now is that we can collapse this, so we can hide it. And uh, out of sight, out of mind, remember. You can also hold the Alt key when I expand on this little triangle, and as you can see, it automatically also expanded the children here as well. So if you want to expand the whole hierarchy, hold the Alt key when you press on these little triangles, and it'll collapse and decollapse them. So what is the deal now with prefabs, and why are they so useful? If I select this game object, we can see... Let's expand this here as well. <laughs> I've already messed it up again, but we can collapse this again later on. But if I select uh, the floor tile, we can see that it has a box collider here. And if I look on the grass here, we can see that it also has a box collider. And when you're making a game, you want to try to reduce the number of colliders if you can, uh, for two reasons, really. One of them is performance. The fewer colliders that you have, the better your game will perform, especially on mobile devices, for example. And also, it makes it a little bit less complex to work with fewer colliders. So you'll know a little bit better what the physics engine is up to and uh, what could be colliding with what. So now we want to remove this grass collider, and we want to make sure that happens for all the game objects. So let's double click on this prefab now instead down here. And you can see that the background here turned blue. It looks a little bit different, and also here we've got in the hierarchy, we've got this uh, title now saying floor tile, and we're actually in prefab editing mode now. And it'll only show you, it won't show you anything from the scene, it'll just show you stuff that's related to this prefab. So let's go to the grass object here, and see this box collider? We can right click on it and remove component. And now we've taken away the collider from the grass part, but the floor tile itself still has this bigger collider on it. If we click this little left arrow, or back arrow here, now when we select these objects, we can actually expand all of these and see that none of these have the box collider anymore for the grass. 
So that's why the prefabs are so useful. And you can make one change. Imagine if you had a thousand floor tiles in a level now and you didn't use prefabs. You'd have that pain to do all this work repetitive over and over again. So keep that in mind. Use prefabs and make the modifications to the prefab. The beautiful thing is that you can also override stuff that prefabs are using. So let's say this floor tile, we wanted the grass to be a little bit taller on this one. So let's go into this grass object. And instead of going into the prefab now, we're actually in this instance of this prefab. So we've selected in this scene view here, and let's make the grass a little bit thicker here. So the Y scale for this grass component, let's change it to 0.4. And we can see that the grass got a lot thicker here, but it didn't affect the other tiles. And another thing that happened is that this text here turned bold, and it's got a little blue mark here. That's, I think the blue mark is new in the new UI here, but it went bold. And we can also see that just the Y position or the Y component for the scale here turned bold. And this is how we can see that it's actually overriding a value. We can right click here now and do either revert if we want to go back to make sure that it was the same as all the other prefabs. It's quite often that you want to do that. You can also do uh, right click and apply to prefab if you want to apply it to all the instances. But quite often, Control Z out of that one, sometimes we just want to override a value of a prefab. And you can do this pretty much anywhere. You could change the material for, uh, for this one. And you can see it turns bold and it's got this little blue thing here. So that's why when, when we know that we're overriding it. If we pick the parent root here of the prefab as well, we can see that there is something here in the inspector and it's got overrides. And we, here is a list as well that could be useful that you can see which overrides are currently in effect. You can revert them all or apply them all, for example, or you, if you want to just check what you have changed or if overridden, that's uh, possible to do here. And here's a little shortcut as well to select the prefab. And it highlights it down here. And you can also open the prefab if you want to go into there. So there are a few shortcuts for you. Okay, so let's go out of prefab editing mode. And uh, let's also revert this one. We don't want the grass to be thicker there or greener for that matter on the other side. And let's press play again. See if it's a, a fun game. No, I'm pressing a lot of stuff here. Can't jump, can't move, can't do anything. We just got a bunch of tiles. So no fun game. Let's press stop again. So now we're going to add a player to see if we can make this game a little bit more fun. First of all, remember out of sight, out of mind. So let's collapse the level for now. And uh, let's right click in the hierarchy and create a 3D object. And this time let's create a capsule. And when you create games, especially your first one, don't start modeling lots of complex stuff in Blender with uh, walk animations and try to bring those in. Keep it simple like this, I'd suggest. Uh, so the tiles, they're just boxes. The player, it'll be a stupid capsule, but live with that for now. It's really good to keep it so simple, just so you get the basics down. And then you can gradually upgrade your game by replacing this capsule with an actual, maybe a sliding player, and then maybe a walking player in the end. But we're going to make a capsule for now. So that's what I recommend to start with. Let's manually type in the transform here to 000 to begin with, to have it centering the scene. And now it's in the same location as this tile. So we can move it up a little bit in the air. And that's OK. We can have it drop, fall down. A gravity will bring him down to the ground in just a minute. But it's also a little bit big for being a player, maybe compared to the tile. So let's change the scale to 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Maybe we'll keep the Y at a, an even 2 here as well. Also, this light doesn't have to be there to annoy you because this is a directional light. It doesn't really matter where it's placed. You can send it in far away, far, far away, because it'll always just have a, the same angle of the light. So you can just move that one out of the sight. Let's go back to our player. Let's rename this one. It's not going to be called Capsule. We're going to call it Player. Let's do it one more time. Let's press play and see if this is a fun game. Nope, it still sucks. OK, so what can we do to improve this? Well, we should be adding some physics now. Since it's a platformer, we want the player to be falling down and hitting the tile and fall off the world if he misses a tile. We're going to add a component now called a rigid body. And a rigid body is something I usually get if I do something complicated, like trying to pick up a sock from the floor. I'll pull my back and I get a really rigid body. But in this case, that's not what it is. So. We can add a component here. So in the inspector with the capsule selected, we'll click Add Component. We can type in here Rigid. And we don't want the 2D one because we're making a 3D game. So let's pick 3D or the one just called Rigid Body here. By default, it gets a mass of one kilogram, but that's fine for now. We can just keep it like that. We also have a few other things like should we apply gravity? And yes, we should. And should it have drag? No, it doesn't have to have drag at the moment. And so that's air resistance and things like that. Just keep everything default and let's press play again. And we can see now that the player or capsule just fell down and hit the ground. So it's already Unity's physics engine is already in the works for you now. So it's still not a fun game because we can't do anything. But at least we fell from the sky and hit the ground. 
So we finally got some movement in our game. Isn't that amazing? We still can't control it, so it's not a game, but at least something moved after all this talking. So what this rigid body thing is doing now, it's a it's got a mass of one kilogram, it's applying gravity, and it's pulling this capsule, our player, down towards the ground. And this capsule collider is colliding with this box collider. And when it's doing that, it's preventing it from pull it, pushing through this box collider. We can actually switch back into the scene view now. Uh, you can independently go through uh, the game view and the scene view when you play. You can even uh, drag this one out, actually, if you want, uh, and look at them at the same time. That's perfectly fine, too. Let's keep it there for now. Uh, so this capsule collider, if I even, you can even modify it here. Uh, we're still in play mode, as you can see up here. And if I drag this capsule up, it'll drop it down. Drag it up, drop it down, drag it up. If I drag it to the side, it'll fall over. So that's pretty nifty in Unity. You can actually modify the game scene as you're playing the game. If you want to test something, uh, you can reposition it and uh, without having to stop and start the game. Just keep that in mind. You can modify stuff in the scene view as the game is playing. And you can also pause a game. So let's uh, restart it here, and then I pause it here. I can still move it to here and see, okay, I want to have this one, oh, if I can hit it there, and then, mm, yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. Let's unpause it and see what happens. And that's uh, useful to know as well, possibly. And also, when you come out of play mode, it'll reset it to the way everything was before you pressed play, because you don't want to the game to remember how it was when you stopped the game. Like, if the player dies, for example, you want to have everything reset. So Unity also does that for you. When I press play again, or the stop button in that case, it'll reset everything to the way the level starts, or the scene starts. Just remember now, before the days of Unity and the other game engines, there wasn't such a thing as a built-in uh, physics engine. If you wanted something to fall down to the ground, you first had to code the part that dropped the, that applied the physics to the game. So uh, it's become a lot easier nowadays, luckily enough, to make games, and we can focus on our creativity instead of uh, coding a physics engine, but maybe that's something you're interested in. So that could be fun as well, obviously. Okay, side note. Okay, now we're going to be adding some user input. So for a game to be fun, we have to have some form of user input, and that's going to involve some scripting. Are you still with me? Don't worry about it. If you haven't created any scripts before, or if that's been scaring you off all the time, don't let it scare you off, because a script can be very, very simple and easy, and you can learn more and more as you go along. That's how I learned scripting. I started to think, just actually, this is exactly what I did the first time I tried to make a game. I wanted something to happen. So I created two boxes, and I wanted one box to hit the other one, and then I just gradually increased my scripting skills that way. So don't be afraid. We'll get through this. Don't worry about it. You'll repeat it, you'll learn it, and uh, you'll get there. So have I convinced you to continue now? Let's continue. So we're going to do something at a very basic level now, and I recommend using C Sharp. That seems to be the most common uh, scripting language that's used in um, Unity, and it's also very versatile and useful in other cases. So I recommend that you learn that one. A lot of stuff that you do Google search for will return results uh, for C Sharp scripts for you. There's also JavaScript. Uh, I used to start with that one, but I've since long switched to C Sharp. I find that one to be a lot more, a lot more better. <laughs> A lot better. Okay, so now cast your scripting fears away, go to the root asset folder here, and in the empty space, let's right click, do create folder, and let's call it scripts. And double click on that one to go into it. And now let's right click in the script folder here and create, and this time we're going to do a C sharp script. And let's call this one player and press enter. Unity will keep the extension here, as you can see, but here in the view, it'll just show you the, the name of it. So we've got the, our first script created now. We can double click on this script. Here, actually, I should mention as well that if you go to Edit, Preferences, then you'll have external tools here. And my external script editor is Visual Studio 2019 Community, and that's uh, free to use for anyone. But I think, uh, oh yeah, maybe that's all that is supported nowadays. It used to be mono, uh, but maybe it doesn't come with that anymore. I recommend that you use Visual Studio anyway. It's a great editor. So when we double clicked on this script and it loaded in Visual Studio, you're actually looking at the first script that Unity creates by default. And again, don't be scared. We'll go through this and you'll nail it in the end. If you know what this default script is all about, just skip forward. But for those of you who've seen a script for the first time, I'm actually going to go through this with you. But I'll timestamp everything in the description so you can fast forward to other sections if you want to skip ahead. So I'm going to start from the top here. And the first thing that we see here is uh, this keyword called using. And it says using system collections. And it says using collections generic. And it says using N Unity engine. 
And this is something that's called declaring the namespace. And again, you don't really have to learn this in much detail, but I'll tell you anyway, because I want to leave no stone unturned uh, in the first thing I do in a new script here. But if we have this using Unity engine here, it's just telling the engine or it's telling Unity what namespace to use. Just to demonstrate, if I were to take this line away, let's just delete it. You can see that something happened here. This one turned red squiggly. It doesn't understand the mono behavior. Okay, what's that? And that's because that was hiding in this uh, Unity engine namespace. And what that is basically, it's a collection of uh, lots of stuff that you can do in your script. Uh, so it just knows to look without having to type it. If I were to type in here, Unity engine period, then it finds it again. But you don't necessarily want to have to type this all the time. Unity engine period something. Unity engine period something. Unity engine period something. So that's the whole reason for this uh, using statement here. Using Unity engine. And as you learn scripting, you'll find that you want to bring stuff more into this using stuff by adding, maybe you want some UI stuff, for example, that would be needing to using the unityengine.ui, for example. Uh, so again, don't be afraid of this. It's just here to, to uh, make it the script a little bit simpler and just keep these as default for now. The second thing I should mention here is the semicolon and all the lines in C Sharp ends with a semicolon. And that's how you differentiate from a new line. And just as I say that, I realize that not every line ends with a semicolon because when you have stuff down here, like a, a method, which is a function, then it doesn't need this, but every command inside this function will need it. So you'll have to get a little bit used to when to use it and when not to use it, but most of the time you're going to have to put a semicolon at the end. And that's quite a common mistake when you write code later on, you'll find that you've missed it. But luckily enough, the, the script will often tell you that, oh, okay, here's your line of code and you'll usually find it fairly fast. So with a semicolon, you could theoretically do this. You could actually move this line up to here and this one up to here, and uh, it will still work the script because the semicolon is what's telling that it's something new is coming. It's not the line feed itself, but it's not very common to use it like this. Uh, so let's just keep it like this. You want to separate the lines. It's very rare that you want to put multiple things on the same line. Just keep it tidy. Okay, so the next line here, we've got something called public class player colon money behavior. And a class is basically a collection of uh, variables and functions uh, that the object-oriented language of C-sharp can use to create stuff. Let's just keep it simple as that. We don't have to demystify it more than that at the moment, but remember when we created the script, we named it player, and Unity automatically named the class player here. And we don't have to worry about this too much more now. Let's just keep it in mind now that we can, in this class, inside this class, we can have different types of variables and functions to store values, and we can have some functions to do stuff like jumping or moving. Before we move on now, we should actually add this script, which is also a component to our player. I minimized uh, Visual Studio here and back into our project folder. I'll take this script now and I'll click my left mouse button, drag it onto the player here. And that automatically adds this one. If we select the player now, we can scroll down. We see we have the transform, the mesh filter, mesh renderer, we've got the capsule collider, rigid body, and hair. Pow, a new component. And this is uh, our player script. And what's important here as well is that the name here of uh, the class needs to be the same as the C Sharp script name. Let's say you wanted to change this one and it, it was called uh, hero instead or something. Control S to save it. Now when I go back here, we can see here that it's shouting a little bit. We've got a little exclamation point. The associated script cannot be loaded. Please fix any compiler errors and assign a valid script. And keep in mind, if you get some error like that, it's because the name here of the class needs to be the same player. And if I rename that one, press Control S, select the player again, we can see that that error has disappeared. If you did want to rename the script and the class, click here on the class name, press F2, which is the shortcut to rename, and then type it in here instead. You can see that it turned a little bit cyan colored or light blue. We'll type hero there when we pressed F2, remember that, F2. And now when we go back into Unity, you can see that it'll do some work and it actually re-imported it. It renamed the C-sharp file now to hero and everything worked again. The player now has the component called hero instead. But let's go back, we wanted to keep it named player. So F2 again and press enter. Okay, so we've got one more thing on this line that we didn't demystify yet, and that's this colon mono behavior. What the is that? So, 
a class can inherit something from a parent class. A little bit like the game object, the child grass game object that inherited the location of the parents, for example, and then applied its own little uh, custom uh, <laughs> local location. But in the same way, the, this, uh, this player class that we've just created is inheriting from something called monobehavior. And monobehavior is a Unity predefined. It's a whole bunch of uh, toolkits that is contained within this parent class. It'll have so many things. When you look in the Unity documentation later on, pretty much anything that you can do in, in the scripting language that's relating to Unity specific things, it's inherited through this monobehavior. You could also have classes that don't have this inheritance, but then you'll lose out on all of those nice features. And as I mentioned before, when you create a default script, the mono behavior here is by default. So let's just keep it there and see what it can bring us. And then we have this squiggly bracket. And when you've defined a class like this, like our player class, it has to start and stop by these uh, squiggly brackets, open bracket and close bracket. And now we get to something called a method here. So we've got something that was also pre-configured here. It says void start open close normal bracket. And this is called a method. And in other programming languages, it's usually called a function, but the C sharp name for this is a method. And uh, this uh, line was also included kindly by Unity. And it says start is called before the first frame update. And here is actually something that this mono behavior now brought us. Since we're inheriting from mono behavior, mono behavior contains a whole bunch of these type of methods that we can use to put scripts or script code in. And as it says here, this start method will be called the first thing, basically, when, when you press play and we have our, our capsule now, our player created here, it'll run this automatically. Whatever is inside these squiggly marks here of this method, it'll run that piece of code and it'll only do it once and then it'll move on. And usually when you create a, a method, it doesn't have this automatic run feature. That's something that's quite uh, specific for Unity now. If you had created your own method here, let's call um, jump, for example, like this, then it, this one doesn't get called automatically by any means. Uh, it's just there. So it's a bit tricky sometimes to know which ones are Unity default or which can you have. And that's when you have to revert to uh, the Unity documentation. But I'll cover uh, the most important ones in this video as well. And then this void thing, what's that all about? And the word void means nothing. And this is what the method or function will be returning. And it's not, if it says void here, it doesn't return anything. And by default here, this start method that comes with the money behavior, it doesn't return anything. So that's why, uh, and it also has to have something. And if it shouldn't return anything, you have void. If it should return something, it needs to be stated what type of information it should return. But we can get into that later on as well. And the next thing we have here is another method that comes by default with the, this money behavior, and that's update. An update uh, is a method that's called by Unity automatically every time the frame is rendered. So once every frame, it'll go through this for all of your scripts or all of your game objects that have different components, it'll find this update and execute whatever piece of code is in this update method. And it'll do it once during that frame and then it'll leave it alone. And when it comes back next frame, it'll do it again and 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 again. And it'll just keep going like that forever, pretty much until you run out of power. So the frame rate actually will depend a little bit on how your game is configured. And um, usually it runs about 60 frames per second, but if you've disabled something called uh, V-Sync, if you've ever seen that in a game, maybe that's disabled, then it could theoretically run a thousand frames per second if it's a really simple game. So the number of times this is called, you can't rely on it being a specific value every time. So you have to keep in mind now that when we put code here, if you were to say that it should move one unit distance every update, then on a really slow computer, it'll move uh, based on the frame rate on a really fast computer it'll just shoot off screen because it rendered a thousand frames and it moved one unit so that's something we'll keep in mind a little bit later on as well and finally again just these open and close bracket is just saying now for this method called start and for this one called update we have a, a beginning and an end so the code that we put within these squarely brackets here is what's going to be executed in this method so now we're finally going to write our first line of code. And what we want to do is create something called an if statement and check if you as a human player, is, if you're pressing a jump button, we want our little capsule player to jump. That's our objective for now. So what we're going to create is something called an if statement. And that's very common in many programming languages. Also, we want to put that here in the update because we don't just want to check if you jumped at the beginning of the game. That wouldn't really work. So we have to check for this jump button in every frame. So in this update method, that's where we need to put our code. Because we want at any time in the game, 
the player should be able to press jump and the player should jump. Let's just put this in as an example. So if I, if in real world, for example, if you're hungry, so if hungry equals true, then you would do something, you'd eat. <laughs> so now this cone wouldn't work, but I just wanted to put as an example, an if statement is if something is something, then do something. So if hungry is true, then eat. <laughs> So that's something you do in real life. That wouldn't work here because we need to check for an input instead and do something in the game. For this example to work, uh, we would need something called a variable. And uh, this, uh, if you want to check if something is true or false, the data type of that variable is a boolean or a bool, a bool. For this example to work, just to make sure I, I don't leave any stones unturned, like I said before, we could have declared a variable here uh, of the data type bool called hungry. So if you put something that's not inside one of these methods here, I put it at the very top here, I declared a variable called hungry. And it's a bool data type. So it's not a number, it's not a piece of text. A bool can only be true or false. And see how, then I typed in here bool hungry, which is declaring this one. Then the if statement, suddenly the red lines here disappeared because now there is such a thing called, it's, there is a variable uh, that's called hungry. And we can check if that one is true. And, you might ask, why is there two equal signs here instead of just one? And that's in uh, C sharp. If you have one equal sign, it's actually setting this variable. So it would set hungry to true. And we don't want to do that. We want to check it. And the syntax for doing that is having two equal signs. So maybe a little bit confusing at first, but you'll get used to that one. So this one is still squiggly here. Uh, it's called eat. Uh, and that was uh, a method that we wanted to call. So I'd have to declare this one. And here's another thing, actually. You could type it like this, void eat. And those squigglies will disappear now because there is a method now. If, if the variable hungry is set to true, then it would call this uh, eat function or eat method and execute whatever code is in here. But there's actually a nice way to, to do this as well, I should mention. When this one's red squiggly like this, in Visual Studio, you can press control period. And then it'll give you some uh, nifty options here. It says generate method for player.eat. So if I click on that one, it already declared this one. It actually threw out some more code that we don't necessarily need. Uh, private is to say if uh, only this script should be able to access it or if another script should be able to call it. That's why the difference between private and public is. Uh, by default, if it's not typed there, it is private by default. And here as well, when it auto-generates it, it just uh, creates a line of code to throw an error. <laughs> it creates an error that it's not been implemented yet. But uh, it's very common in uh, Visual Studio here that you can use the control period. It, we could have done the same here when we wanted to declare this variable. We take this one away, so we're back to here. I click on this hungry here, I press control period. And then it says generate field. Actually, the proper name isn't variable, it's called a field in C sharp. But it, if you hear variable or fields, it's usually the same, pretty much. So we can generate the field player hungry. And you see, it declared it as private, it was the bool, it knew since we were checking if it's true, it knew that it should be a bool data type and it knew that it was going to be called hungry. So again, we're not going to check if we're hungry, we're not going to eat, we're going to check if the player should jump. So let's make something real, should we? So if I press space now, I should be able to jump. So space, jump, get it? <laughs> so let's do that in code now instead. In this update method now, since we needed to do check for this all the time, we have to type an if statement that we just learned a little bit about, and we have to open it with a bracket. So now we have to type the code here. What are we gonna type to check this? We're gonna check for something called input. So, and it happens to be something here. If I start typing now, input, you can see that it's actually suggesting here a bunch of things. Usually when I wanna do something, I Google it. Uh, let's see, I wanna check for input. I Google uh, Unity C Sharp uh, input or jump or something like that. And then it'll give me a bunch of things and that will direct me to either some uh, sample code or the Unity documentation. And it'll tell you a lot of stuff, how to check for input and how to do it. And as you learn this, and I Google all the time, pretty much every day as I type code, I have to Google it all the time. I have to go to the documentation back and forth, but gradually you'll learn more and more and more. So we're gonna type input here. And then, we want to check for something. And if I press period now, you can see that we've co completely typed here, but if I press period, it's got some more stuff here. We can actually start reading what we can check for here. Any key, <laughs> any key like Homer Simpson would have pressed. 
we can either scroll through here and see what there is. There's a lot of stuff here. Like, uh, ooh, let's see, get access. What could that be? Maybe a joystick. Uh, we've got get key, get a key press. We have uh, get joystick names, uh, key down, mouse button up and down. You see, uh, Visual Studio will give you all these things just for free. So uh, we want to check what did we want to check. We wanted to check for a, um, a key. Let's make let's make uh, space the button that we need to press for jumping. So get. Is there something called key? Yeah, key. And should it be on uh, key down, maybe? When you hit space bar, then we want to check that one. And now it's out of uh, suggestions here, but it gives us uh, something here as well. So get key down. Then we have to provide something here called a key code. So what could that be? I press bracket again, as it was expecting, and it's already suggesting here, key code. OK, so let's uh, double click on that one. And it was space, so maybe we press period again here. Oh, it's actually suggesting a bunch of key codes. We can scroll up and down here with the up and down arrows. So let's see. Or maybe we can type here. Sp yeah, we can. Space. So just by knowing that we wanted to check for input and we wanted to check for some sort of a key command and we wanted to check space, the combination of the starting to type what you need and also Googling what you need will help you along the way to, do, to find out what you wanted to do. And we, all we wanted to do was check for a space key to be hit. And this is what we ended up with. And we wanted to see if this one is true. So equals equals true. So if get key down, and that's actually the down action. It's not if it's pressed all the time. If I would have just typed input dot get key instead of get key down, it would actually return true every time as long as I'm holding space down. But if I'm only checking it on the key down action, it'll only do it once. So if I hit key, even if I hold it down, it'll just jump me once. And after you have uh, checked an input, remember we needed to have the squiggly open and close bracket here. The only reason why this input actually existed in the first place, again, is because we've got this using Unity engine. So if this one wasn't there, press Control S, see, it has no clue what we wanted to do. So all of this is very Unity specific and it's requiring this using Unity engine. Then it knows, oh, I'm going to look in the Unity engine. I'm going to see, OK, there's an input thing. We can handle the keyboard input. We can check for key DAOs, <laughs> joystick, mouse, you got it. We could improve this code a little bit more as well because we wanted to check if this one is true. And if you wanted to check input get key down, this is, we can see it as well here, it's a bool. Remember, we learned what a bool was. It was, could it either just be true or false. But when you write an if statement, you don't really need to write this equals equals true because it's expecting that. If we want to check something, it just expects me, OK, do I want to check if this is true or not? So we can actually take equals equals true away and keep it uh, the code a little bit smaller. But in theory, it still says the, uh, the compiler will still interpret this as saying equals equals true. You can keep your code a little bit tidier if you just want to set if input, get key down, key code space, then do this. And what I mentioned before as well, when we started to get all these freebies with uh, what to type, that's called IntelliSense. Let's see how far we can take this. How much code do we actually have to write to make this thing? If I, let's take it to the extreme. So if I typed I, I wanted to create an if command. Okay, so it's already, see here, IntelliSense is top choice here, since it's so common is if. I press tab, okay. And then I'm gonna do an open bracket. And we wanted to check for input, right? So I press I, N, P, and now we've reached as far as to say the top choice now is it knows that we probably want to type input. So I press tab. OK, period. And then we wanted to check for get key down. So we press G. Oh, see, it's already at the top. And the most common thing to check for input is actually get key down. So I don't even have to type that one. I can just press tab again and accept this top recommended thing here. And then I do another open bracket. And then see, it's already checking. OK, we probably want to check a key code. It's the top choice here or the highlighted choice. So I press tab again. And then we wanted to do space. So I press period and S, P, and then it's suggesting space. And then we do the squiggly marks. <laughs> so how much code did we really have to type there? We had to type, let's see, I, tab, tab, capital I, period, tab, open bracket, tab, period, space, tab, close bracket. <laughs> so. Keep in mind that IntelliSense uh, is really useful. It'll often give you hints on what to type or what it expects and things like that. So don't just ignore that advice. See what comes up when you start typing things. See if that's what you're after. Press tab to complete it. 
and use those uh, hints to help your coding a little bit along the way. The beautiful thing with this is that you don't have to memorize the code, you just have to sort of know what you're after. And in the beginning it'll be a little bit tricky, but as you get more and more used to it, you just have to sort of know what you want to do and start typing a little bit what you think it is, and then hopefully this uh, tab in IntelliSense will help you along the way. And again, combine it with Googling, how do I check for input in Unity, how do I make a player jump, uh, how do I make it uh, not jump, how do I uh, do it every frame, just think of stuff to Google, Google is your friend, hopefully. But we don't want to check this twice, so let's delete that one. That was just an example to show you IntelliSense. Also, these uh, maybe I didn't really make this one clear before, but these double slashes here is uh, a way to document your own code. So if I press enter here and do slash slash, we can actually write something. Let's call check if space key is pressed down. And these are basically just hints in the code or documentation in the code, either for yourself or for your teammates if you're writing code for someone else to, to be working on as well. And I wouldn't suggest going overboard either. You don't have to type uh, comments for every line of code, like yeah, check if space key is pressed down, because it's very apparent here that we're checking if space key is pressed down. But know that you can write these type of comments, and often you want to you want to use these comments when there's something that maybe it's not so intuitive, like why are you doing something? Maybe you've done some, something that looks a little bit awkward, or why am I doing that in this update loop, or why am I uh, doing this? That could be a time, but often try to get the code itself to document itself. And if you need to add stuff, like here Unity has added this, update is called once per frame, it tells us something. Okay, so this is just not any method, this one is actually called once per frame, so that's a useful message. This one is not so useful. It's also very important where we put this line of code. So this if statement now, when we did check for it, if key down, that's actually only valid one frame in your entire, when you're playing the game here, it runs through this update loop over and over again. And the moment that you hit space, the key down here, it's actually only reported once on that frame. And then it's not gonna be reported again until maybe you release space and press it again. That's the second time it'll hit this line of code. So that's why it's important to know that you have to capture it in this update loop. Okay, nothing is happening now. If we press play, let's press, Press Control S. Uh, if I were to start the game now, nothing would really happen because we're only checking if the key down is pressed and it's actually hitting this line of code, but nothing is happening. And we can make sure that we write maybe something, a little hint to see, is this working? We can do something called, uh, that I commonly do is, it's called a debug log message. So let's type debug, press tab on the on, period. Log, I'll suggest we just wanna put a log entry here. And then let's type here, space key, was pressed down. And then remember, we have to end it with a semicolon and strings have to be in these uh, quotation marks here as well. So this is again, something that Unity has and it's called a debug and a function here or a method called log and it'll send this string here now to our console. And we haven't covered the console, so let's minimize this. We'll press Control S to save it, minimize it. And here is a console. It's also here down at the bottom. You have to toggle away from the project window here. You could also drag this one down to the bottom if you wanted to have it visible at all times. But now we press play, we see that it enters here and we press, let's see what happens. We press space and nothing happened because we haven't told the game object to jump yet. But we did get this line of code that we expected, the debug log message that happen, happens here in the console. Even if I was in this project folder, it shows the latest line of the console down here at the bottom, space key was pressed down. So we know that uh, Unity is hidden every time I'm pressing this line out, let's see. Yeah. And you actually have to make sure that you've, this game view should be active. So if it's not updating, maybe you have to click in the game window here to make sure that it's uh, actually active. And then when we hit space every time, it'll log this message. Okay, but we didn't want to log an error message every time we jumped or a, a log debug message. We want to make the player actually jump. So let's do that. So let's make the player jump, really. So now we need to uh, take this uh, log message away. You can either erase it with backspace or you can press Control Y to delete the entire line. Let's think now logically what needs to happen when we press space. We've checked for the input, we press space, and we had something called a rigid body. Remember that is applying physics to make the player drop down to the ground. So there's something gonna do with the, with physics or rigid body. So we have to actually access the component now, the rigid body component. And here we can do that. You can access any component. So let's minimize this. Remember now that this player game object has this player component or the player script. And it also has this rigid body component. So somehow we need this script to be able to access this rigid body. We need to get this component. 
And there's actually something called just that. So here we want to do get component. And then inside these uh, sharp angles, <laughs> greater or less or greater than signs, we can type what type of component was it that we needed to get. And it's the rigid body. So I'll stop typing re and there it's got it. So I press tab to complete it. And then when you get a component like this, this is actually a method. So we need to have these empty brackets. So, and that's the syntax to get a component. And now you can press period to see what can we do with this component. So we've got the access, or we've got a reference to this component now. And when I press period, there's lots of stuff again, lots of magic stuff we can do. Okay, what is there? Move position, we've got velocity. That's probably how fast it's moving at the moment. We can add force, we can add explosion force, cool stuff. We can, uh, let's scroll down. We can change the center of mass on it. We can uh, probably change the mass itself. Let's scroll down and see. Remember that was one kilogram in the inspector. So we can actually set it here to something else if we wanted to through program. But what do we want to do? We want to add a force probably to make the player jump up. So let's type add force. Okay, so when we press space, we want to get access to the rigid body component and we want to add a force. So, so far so good. Open bracket here. And then it suggests we need a vector three, a force. Vector three. So a vector three, what, what is that? Um, that's something that has got a direction and a magnitude. So it can point in some direction and it has how much, how large or how, what's the magnitude of that force. Uh, so remember now the X axis is left and right. The Y axis is up and down and the Z axis is back and forth. And that's how Unity's coordinate system work. And when you jump in this case, which direction do you think you want to jump? So, okay, we probably want him to jump upwards. You could probably run and jump forward as well, but we want to apply the force upwards as you jump. And luckily enough, there's actually a predefined vector already. So we can type vector three dot up. And that would take, uh, and by default, this up has, as you can see, shorthand for writing vector three, and then in brackets here, zero comma, and then the Y component is one, which is up one unit and then zero on the z-axis. Okay, we're gonna apply the up force, but then if we type comma again, we see if there's something else we need to provide. And there's something called force mode here, and we have to pick the right force mode. So if I press tab again, okay, what, let's see, if we press period, it'll suggest what type of force mode we have. And we have acceleration, force, impulse, and velocity change. And here for acceleration, add a continuous acceleration to the rigid, rigid body, ignores its mass. Force, add a continuous force to the rigid body using its mass. We've got impulse, add an instant force impulse to the rigid body using its mass. And velocity change, add an instant velocity change to the rigid body ignoring its mass. So now we can think, okay, which one is probably appropriate for us? We don't probably wanna have acceleration because we don't want to accelerate it up. We just want to make it go up. Also force, it's using the mass. So it would basically jump different heights based on what the mass value was set. So if it's one kilogram, 100 kilograms, and for our simple platformer game, we don't want it to have a, really pay attention to how much the player is weighing. So we probably ignore that one. Impulse also uses the mass. So we probably just want to do a velocity change here. We'll, instantly set the velocity to something and then we ignore the mass. So let's pick that one. Let's try this. So we have to end this line out with a semicolon. Remember, I press control S. So let's see if this works now. We press play and then we jump. Oh, okay. It's jumping, but not very much. <laughs> okay. So the force, the magnitude of this vector up is not enough. It's adding a velocity change up, but the gravity is capturing us way too fast and sending us down again. So let's go back and multiply this. We can actually multiply it by five, for example. Press Control S again to save it. It's important to Control S to save every time, otherwise Unity won't really know that something has happened. Press play again and press space. And now we've got a jump. That's a pretty decent jump, but we still can't steer anywhere, so it's not a fun game. Oh, and here's another thing. <laughs> we can multipress. So air jumping, probably not what you wanna do. It's like a, a rocket landing game now suddenly. And it's tilting as well. So is this a game yet? No, it's not. Even though we've got user input, we can't really do anything about it. There's no goal that we can't achieve anything. There's no challenges for us to conquer. So uh, we have to work a little bit longer on this.
It's time to make the player move a little bit, not just up and down, but left and right. Let's make it move along our little platform level here. We'll use the keys A and D to move left and right. So those are the common A, W, S, D keys. I'm supposed to be saying WASD, but I say it A, W, S, D, but it's the WASD key setup. But we'll be using physics to move this as well. There's, you could move it without physics. You could uh, translate it uh, in the scene. Uh, some games will just have translating, <laughs> which means moving the object left and right. But since we've already got some physics going here with the up and down movement, we're going to stick to physics to move this uh, little platform guy of ours. So we have to say hello to another mono behavior. So we've got start and update from before. And there's another one called fixed update. And unless I told you so, you wouldn't necessarily know about that. But again, the Unity documentation will tell you a lot of uh, the existing methods that are already predefined in the mono behavior. But for now, let's do void. Remember, because it's not going to return us anything. Fixed update. And it's suggesting here. So let's do tab. And it's already defined this one. And we could have left the private keyword out, but it stuck it in there for us. So let's just leave it for now to keep it extra obvious that this is only going to be executed within this little script of ours. A fixed comment is a little bit different from update, or it's very different. Even though it runs frequently like the update do, uh, it, let's put a little comment here to make it extra cl clear for us. So fixed update is called once every physics update. So what does that even mean? So by default, Unity runs with a physics engine that updates 100 times every second, so at 100 hertz. And uh, what that means is that the physics engine will update everything in the world 100 times per second. Even if the, let's say you're playing on your grandparents' computer and the game's running like at five frames per second, then that's uh, the physics engine will still update as if it was running at 100 seconds. So anything that's falling, like with gravity, for example, will still have the appropriate speed, even though it's like a slideshow because their computer is so slow then uh, at least you know that the physics is reliable. It'll still update the way it should. So the difference here would have been like, again, on your grandparents' machine, it's running update once every five seconds because it's a, a, like a graphics card from 1984. But then the physics update will actually run so it keeps in sync with the proper physics. So I hope that makes sense. So by default, 100 times per second. And again, you can customize this in some games. You might want to increase the frequency and you can change that in preferences, but we're just going to stick to the default of 100 times per second now. And here's something very important now. Remember when I told you about this uh, key press here, the get key code down, then it's checking for space. And that's only true once every frame, but that's actually every rendered frame. So we could actually miss it if we stick it here in the fixed update. And that's a, a common mistake to do and very confusing probably. So remember anything that, is registering a key press or a key stroke or a mouse click, you need to have that one in update because you risk missing it in the fixed update. So keep that in mind. And at the same time saying that we're actually applying physics now in the update loop and that's not really good practice either. So we have to change that one as well. It works and uh, because we're adding a force when only once and we're adding a velocity change, then it was sort of okay, but it's not good practice. So we have to fix that. I can't start your first script by breaking a principle. So we have to change this. So there's two things we need to consider here. The key press needs to be registered here in the update loop, but the force should really be applied here in the fixed update. So before we start with the left and right movement here, let's just fix what we did here. So we have to set a little memory here now. So when we hit the keystroke of space, then the computer code here needs to remember that space was pressed and then it needs to do the change here down here in fixed update. I remember I told you about that hunger variable, hungry variable. Well, we're going to apply something similar here. Let's go to the top of this class now, and we're going to declare our first proper field or variable. The proper name is field, but you'll hear variable a lot. And it's going to be a bool type. We only need to check if it's true or false. And up here we type private, and we could have really left that one out, but let's make it ultra clear now that this is a private variable. Only this script will know about this one. And it's going to be a bool type. So after the private comes the data type. And if it would have been a number, it would have said int there. If it was a string we wanted to keep track of, it would have been saying string there. But we want to just check if something is true or false. So we type bool there. That's the data type. And then we're going to create a, our field name or our variable name. And let's do jump key was pressed. It's also very good practice to name your variable something very descriptive. So you don't have to document it. Theoretically, I could have named this variable A or something like that, something that's not used by the scripting language. 
but then it would be really difficult to know when you're looking at the code what what's a what's that do so it doesn't matter if the variable names are a little bit longer just as long as they're descriptive uh, they don't take any more space uh, they don't make your game bigger they don't make the game run any slower it just makes you be able to read them better so let's keep this jump key was pressed and down here now we need to move this code so i can actually we're going to have to do if statement in both here. So I'll mark this with a mouse. I'll just hold the left mouse button, mark that, press Control C to copy it. And then I'll paste it down here in the fixed update, Control V. And we don't really want to do this same check twice, but now we can replace the code here. So in update, we do want to check if the key was pressed down, but we're going to replace this code. So let's take that, mark that one, press delete. And instead of applying the force there, we'll just do jump and remember IntelliSense already knows we're going to type this probably so we'll press tab jump key was pressed equals true and now we only use one equal sign because we're going to set this variable or field <laughs> to true so now we've stored that variable by capturing it here in the update but then we need to apply the force down here so instead of checking for the key down here let's replace this part of the code and here we're going to type if jump key was pressed equals equals remember true because if you want to check if it's equal we don't want to set it to equal that's why you have to two, have two here and also remember that we can take this away we don't actually need the equals equals true the if statement will know that it's going to check if it's true or false since it's a bool type and now we apply the force down here which is the correct way to do it you check for key presses and input in the update loop and then you apply forces in the fixed update okay let's try to press play now and see what happens what do you think will happen did you spot anything? So if I press space now, whoa, it became Rocket Man. So why is that? Well, let's look at the script again. It's setting it to true, but it's never setting it to false again. Once it's applied the force here, this variable is kept to true. So every time we hit the fixed update loop here, it'll apply that force because jump key was pressed is still true. So when we've checked for this, we need to reset it back to false. So I'll press enter here and create a new line jump key was pressed we're going to need so i'll press tab there and let the intellisense do the job equals false so we set that one to false now so this should make this only run once now until we press the key again so let's minimize this one press play and press space and now it only jumps once so that's nice that's what we wanted so we've changed and added code now but the game is still behaving exactly like before so what's up with that well, you've successfully just done your first refactoring of code, and this is something you will be doing a lot when you make games. You won't write perfect code straight away, first of all, and you'll never write perfect code. And you shouldn't really even try to write perfect code, because if you do that, you'll fail to make a game. So what you will be doing is like iterate over your code over and over again, improve it over time, change it, update it, make it run a little bit better, like make it a little bit more structured, but not more than necessary. And what we did now was really necessary to keep it tidy. We needed to check for the input in the update and we needed to apply physics in the fixed update. So it was pretty necessary what we needed to do here. Don't spend too much refactoring either. You'd basically get stuck in an infinite loop trying to improve your code over and over again. And uh, I once heard a quote uh, saying, someone said that you don't have to write pretty code to make a fun game. And when I Googled that to see who actually wrote that quote, it was only one Google hit, and that was a post that I wrote about three years ago or something. <laughs> but I'm very sure I didn't come up with a quote. But keep that in mind. You don't have to write pretty code to make a fun game. Try to structure it quite nicely and try to make it by the book, but don't overdo it. It's perfectly fine if it's uh, not the best practice. Uh, if it runs, if it works, that's great. And improve it over time if you need to. So now we're finally going to add that horizontal movement and we have to declare another variable here. So at the top under the jump key was pressed, we'll do another one private float. It's going to be called this time. I'll tell you why in just a second. Horizontal input. If you're wondering why I'm starting my variable names here with a lowercase and then I have uppercase for every subsequent word. It's called camel case, and it's quite a common way to write your variables or field names. Usually methods will have a capital letter all the way through, and capital is like fixed update here, for example, and private variable commonly have, has this. You'll also find that they can start perfectly fine with the capital, and it's really down to personal preference, 
but this is one type of naming convention that I tend to use. For public properties, for example, I would have started with a capital case. Then I know it's a public one. And for these private ones, I start with a lowercase. So this horizontal input now, it, we've just declared it. But what is a float? Well, a float is a number. It's a floating point number, it's called. And that's a data type that can store a value like uh, 3.14, for example, for pi. It could also store 3.0, but it doesn't... The strange thing about float numbers is that it doesn't necessarily mean that it's exactly 3.0000 forever. And that's a little bit strange with the floats. It'll do its best to represent a decimal number, but with its limitation. And usually for, for the purpose of what we're making, it's perfectly fine. It's when you run into... Like, if you wanted to check uh, if 3. Point, uh, and then a whole bunch of decimal numbers equals... And then 3. Point, a whole bunch of decimal numbers you might run into issues there that you should be aware of. But for our purpose, this is going to be perfectly fine. So a float is a decimal number. And that's because we're not going to check for a key down this time. We're going to check for the input of an axis. And it could be a joystick axis. It could be the mouse movement, for example. But it's also actually registering the axis for the uh, A and D key that we have for movement and for the arrow keys. So here in our update method, let's press enter a couple of times. And let's do... And this time, we're not going to do an if statement. We're going to write horizontal horizontal input tab there equals and then we have to revisit this we still want to check for an input like we did before so we have input we press tab to complete it period and this time we didn't want to check a key we wanted to check an axis so get we it's already suggested there get axis and the reason why it knew that we probably wanted to get axis this time is because we're trying to feed this value back into this horizontal input, which is a float. So it knows, oh, well, you probably want an axis because that will return a float. So that's how it knew that's what we probably wanted. And then I have to write here in quotation mark, this is actually a string and it's called horizontal again. And it says here string axis name. And again, how come I knew that it was going to say horizontal here? And it's because I've made Unity games for quite some time. But there is actually a logic to this. So it's not just any word taken out of nowhere. I can go here into Edit, Project Settings, and let's go to Input Manager. And then we have Axis here. And then we have Horizontal. These are the different axes and buttons. You also have, instead of doing a key code like we did for space, there's, for example, the, the Jump button here, which is uh, space, funny enough. So we could have checked for a Get button instead of a Get key down. Here's the Input uh, Manager, and there's an axis here called Horizontal. And then we can see We've got a negative and a positive button, and it's called A and D. And those are the keys that we wanted to check for, the standard inputs for, for example, a first-person shooter movement. We were actually reading the alternative buttons because the default negative and positive buttons are the left and right keys. So you'll be able to press either left or right on your keyboard or A and D to achieve the same uh, input. You also have some settings here, so gravity and dead and sensitivity. And that's when you press a D key, since that's actually a digital key, it'll either be down or up. But these settings here can make it gradually increase it, like you were twisting a joystick uh, gradually or slowly or fast. So these values you can change around a little bit if it's not direct enough or if it's too fast, you can change these values later on. So that's how I knew that uh, there was an axis named horizontal. And you can revisit that input manager if you want to see what the axes are called again. And you can even define your own ones there as well, if you wanted a, a yaw, a roll, and a pitch axis, for example, for a flight game. So let's recap a little bit what we've done. We knew that a bool is a true or a false. We knew that a float variable type can contain a decimal number, which is this horizontal input. And we knew that a string here can contain characters. This is a string class. So now we need to use this information. So we've collected here horizontal input. It takes this in all the time. And we don't have to do an if statement, like I said, because if we're not touching these keys, A, D, or left and right, it'll just feed in zero here all the time. So the horizontal input will be zero every frame. But as soon as we hit a key, it'll start increasing that value or decreasing it, either negative for left or positive for right. So we need to make something happen now. We scroll down to the fixed update because we wanted to apply the physics. Remember, we have to do that in fixed update. So again here, we'll do get component. It's again the rigid body that we need to access. And now we're going to change the velocity. We don't apply a force. Let's just change the velocity directly. So left or right. So I press tab to autocomplete that velocity. And now this velocity is specified in a vector 3. And remember, that's something uh, with three axes, x, y, z, or x, y, z, and a magnitude, so the size of it. So in C sharp, this might be a little bit confusing, but you actually have to define a new vector three. So 
we'll type the new keyword here, vector3. And then we have to supply what information here in the brackets, what should the accesses be. And here we type in this float variable that we collected up here. So horizontal input. And that's the X movement here. So left and right of our character. And then comma, we don't want to alter in this case, we don't want to make any changes to Y, which is up and down. So we'll type zero there. And then comma again, and we don't want to do anything in the depth forward or backwards into our scene. So let's put zero here as well. And this might be a little bit confusing because what we're taking this value now from our left and right key movement, and we wanted that to be the X component of this velocity. And the velocity of a rigid body is the movement speed. Let's press play and see what happens. Okay, so something's strange now. What's happening with the gravity? Hmm. See, it used to fall down quite fast and it tumbles over now when I moved it. So it's something really strange. We've done something wrong here. And the reason why that is happening is because, remember, here we're adding force, but here we're setting the velocity to up and down to zero. We're forcing it back to zero. So we're applying force and then directly after we're saying, well, the speed up and down is going to be zero. And that's why it's fighting with itself. Now it's applying a force, but it's resetting the speed to zero. So we have to fix that. So instead of setting it to zero here, we can actually leave the velocity of the Y component or the up and down movement to uh, the same value that it was. And we can do that again. It's actually stored in this uh, velocity already. So theoretically, we could copy this control C and put it for the Y component here, velocity dot Y. You can actually access the individual X, Y, and Z components here. So this would say that, okay, we want the velocity to be a vector three and the vector three should be the horizontal input, but we want to remain the velocity of the Y component should be the same. So we don't want to affect that. So let's try to press play again here. So now when we press space, it works. Uh, it's not slowing down, it's jumping up and down. And when I move, it's actually not sliding or moving, it's tumbling over. And that's because we've got friction at the bottom of this uh, collider, where this capsule collider is hitting the floor tile. We've got friction here, so that's why it's uh, leaning over. But theoretically, we've got something that could nearly be a game now. We've got a challenge here. I have to clear that gap, and I could. So we're on our route to making a game now. M maybe not a very fun one, but... It could be called maybe like Flappy Salmon or something could be a thing. I don't know. Flappy Pill. Pill Flapper. Flappy Pill. Fill the Pill. Fill the Pill Flapper. Flappy Flappy Fill Pill. Flappy Pill Fill. No, I don't know. Also, I noticed this as well, that when we press play now, you can actually jump in the air. So we've theoretically actually accidentally caused a Flappy Bird clone. <laughs> so by pressing the jump button multiple times, we've created our first clone of a game as well. So there you go. Just launch it in the App Store now and make millions. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to start fixing our first bugs. Maybe that's not the, the most fun sounding thing, but it could be quite amusing sometimes. I've, uh, when I'm making games, <laughs> some of the bugs I run into are hilarious. You'll have so many unexpected things happening and it'll make you laugh over and over again. So take it with a grain of salt, try to enjoy the bugs and uh, fight your way through them to eliminate them. So in our code here now, there's one thing I was reacting on and that was that we type uh, the same thing here over and over again. We have get component rigid body here. We've got get component rigid body here, and we've got it here again. And I also happen to know that it's not very good to do this all the time, because every time you get a component, Unity will have to look at the game object, see what components do I have, and it has to grab a reference to that. So for two reasons. A, the code is a little bit messy, because we have repeating it, but more importantly, we're actually slowing it down a little bit. It wouldn't really be a problem for our little flappy, flappy uh, pill clone or whatever we we're going to call it, but I want to show you how to improve this a little bit. So up here where we have our fields or variables, let's declare a new one now, private, and it's going to be the type rigid body. Let's call that one for clarity, rigid body component. So we've declared a new variable or field <laughs> up here, and then now we're actually going to use this start method. Remember that this one only runs once and the component, the rigid body component will never change. So here we can type rigid body component tab to autocomplete it equals get component rigid body. And now it takes this uh, reference to the rigid body and it stores it in this rigid body component variable that we've got. And now we can copy this here 
and replace this one down here. So we don't have to type that one over and over again. So we're improving performance and making it a little bit easier on the eye. And again, the code, the game will actually do exactly the same thing now, but we've uh, improved the performance and done it a little bit more by the book. And I just said, you don't have to do everything by the book, but you'll find the balance in the end. The actual bug that we had though, was that the player was tumbling over here. So remember, we press play, it's tumbling over. How do we fix that? Well, there's a few things that we could do. For example, first of all, remember, out of sight, out of mind. So let's collapse the level. We don't want to see that. For our player here, if we look at the rigid body, there's something called constraints here that I can expand. So when we've got that expanded, we've got something called freeze position and freeze rotation. So we want to freeze the rotation. Remember, it's tumbling over and we don't really want this player to ever rotate. So we can actually freeze all the rotations. Let's try that and press play. And now it's sliding pretty good. And we can jump maybe still, yeah. And we could even clear that gap. <laughs> Go back. Go back. Come back. Sometimes you'll actually change these things. You could change these on the fly while the game is playing. And remember, it's tumbling over now. And if I press stop now, you'll see that these will reset back. And that's probably a common mistake that you'll do sometimes as well. You'll change something in play mode. I do this again all the time, unfortunately. When you realize that you were in play mode, you press stop and everything that you changed reverts back. So that could be a little bit of a pain, but you, you'll get used to it. Also, the position, we're moving left and right and up and down, but theoretically, our game object could be going this way. And especially if you have a lot of collisions going, then it could actually move in the way that we didn't want. So we can even freeze this. Uh, remember, the blue axis here is the Z axis. So we can freeze the position on the Z axis. And if I press play now, it'll look the same. But we've just protected ourselves from the object being able to fall in or out of the scene. So you could actually apply this freeze uh, position as well. OK, we had another bug as well, remember, or a feature. And that was that we could jump in the air. And we're not going to make the flappy board clone now. That's already been done and many clones with it. So we need to protect ourselves from the player being able to cheat and use a glitch jump in the air. There's multiple ways you can do to fix that, but we'll just pick one method. And again, let's define another variable up here, private, and it's gonna be a bool. And let's call that one is grounded. We need to check if we're grounded or not. And then there's another money behavior that we can make use. Again, as I said before, there's multiple ways you can do this, and I tend to vary between them, but this is one method that we can use. So we have a method here, so let's start by typing void, and then this one is called on collision enter. And if you press tab, it'll auto-complete it with a bunch of stuff. And this is actually giving us something that we haven't seen before, and this is uh, typing collision, and then this is the data type, uh, and a variable named collision. And that means that when we have a collision, we can actually get some free information here. This collision will contain, for example, information of the coordinate where the collision was, what velocity it was. Um, for example, if I type here collision period, we can see here we've got uh, relative velocity to the two bodies that collided. We've got the other rigid body that we collided with. We've got uh, the contact points. So where are the coordinates that we hit? Um, we're actually not going to need that information for ours. So theoretically, you could actually delete this one if you don't need it. It'll still uh, do what we need to do with it, but we'll just leave it in for now, since that's what uh, IntelliSense automatically gave us when we typed it. So when we detect a collision here, let's just set that is grounded variable that we created to true. And equally, there's another method called on collision exit. So let's do that one. Void on collision exit. And then we'll set is grounded to false. Basically, now when a collision occurs, it'll set is grounded to true. And when you exit the collision, when it's no longer happening again, so when you've jumped, for example, there's no collision at that time. So it'll set is grounded to false. But we need to do something with the information that we are collecting down here. So in this fixed update, we'll type if, and then we're going to put an exclamation mark here, and they say is grounded. And the exclamation mark here, or exclamation point, that means if not. So that's actually taken, if it would have just said that, it's like if is grounded, then we do something. But if there's an exclamation point there, then it's, it means is not. You could also type this like this. If it's not true. Or you could have typed if is grounded is false. So there's multiple ways you can do that. But I commonly keep the code as compressed as I can. So 
exclamation is grounded means if not is grounded. Then we want to execute something here. And here I'm just going to type return. So remember now the physics engine and money behavior will run this fixed update every time it hits the loop. But then it'll detect now, okay, if it's not grounded, then I'm going to return. So I'm going to not execute this code that's down here. So return, you can, you can actually exit a method earlier by doing this. So, okay, if it is grounded, it's going to continue here and it's going to do our key press here for the jump. It's going to do our uh, movement velocity. So if we press play now, and now I'm trying to jump in the air and it's not working. And that's how we wanted it. We don't want to do air jumps in this one. You could do if you want to have double jump feature, you could check here a counter instead, for example, to see if it's been pressed once or twice. But let's just keep it simple for now. So you can only jump when you're on the ground. And now I've run into another bug here. See that I'm actually trying to move this object, but nothing is happening. So what could that be? And I think what's happened here is that we're actually hitting between these two blocks. So if we try again, let's see if we can replicate that problem. I'll move, I'll jump, I'll go here, and there it stops. And I think we're hitting right between two colliders now. So it's exiting and it doesn't really know what to do now. It's right in between these two colliders. So maybe that's not the best method to check for this uh, collision. Okay, so how do we fix that problem? Again, as I mentioned before, it's quite common when you make a game that you'll find that you'll try one approach and it might not work, or you'll find a bug, and then you have to find a different method to do it. So maybe this uh, on collision enter and exit wasn't uh, the best approach, but hey, we learned that those existed, so they, it wasn't exactly for nothing. It was pretty good to know that anyway. But let's uh, let's scrap this method and let's find something else. Let's even take away this uh, is grounded, and uh, go back to where we were, and let's think of a new way. To do that, we can actually check there's another physics feature called overlap sphere, and that will check if a, a sphere is overlapping with something, uh, like a fictional sphere. And uh, if we imagine that we want to check at the feet of the player if it's touching ground, maybe that's a better approach to do it. So first what we're going to do is we're going to put another reference up here, but this one we're not going to make it private. We're going to do public, and this is going to be a transform. So why is that? Hmm. Okay, so ground check transform, we're going to call it. And you'll find something is different now. When we do public here and we minimize this, then when I click on the player here, we can see that something happened. We've got, it's exposed in the inspector. So ground check transform, it actually inserts some spaces here for human readability. You can also change the width of this if you want. Uh, so it's exposed that it's called here. And this is the easiest way to expose something. You could also do something which is the, I think the proper way to do it. So private you could do, but there's a little tag you can put here as well. Serialize field. And that will uh, actually also expose it here. And uh, this is actually the proper way to do it. So we'll leave it like this for now. If you get a warning, I should also mention, then you can actually set that the default value should be null. So again, you could either just keep it at public to be, keep it simple, or you could do this method, which is the proper way to expose stuff in the inspector. It, the result is going to be the same. It's just that you're not exposing it to other classes as well. It's just to the inspector that you do it. Okay, so this now, we've got a ground check transform, but what should we do with this one? It says none here, no transform. And remember what a transform was. That's the position, rotation, and scale of something, of a game object. So. I right click on the player here and let's create an empty game object now. And since I right clicked on the player, it'll create that as a child here and it's called game object. But let's press F2 on it and rename it to ground check transform. And it's positioned in the same place now in the relative position of 000 of the player object, the parent object. And we want to move that to the feet because we want this one to be positioned. We're going to use this as a little helper object to know where our feet location is. And to position it properly, remember we could hold the Alt key and left mouse button to pan around here. But we want to position it pretty much exactly at the bottom. So you can see these, uh, this little uh, axis tool up here. First of all, you can click on an axis like this and it'll view it from the side. But we still don't really know exactly where it is because it's perspective enabled here. So even if we pan around, where is the bottom exactly? You can then also, if I rotate, see that it says perspective here. If I click on that one, it'll switch to isometric or orthographic view. And that removes perspective. So if we click on this uh, z-axis again, you can see now it's basically looking like a 2D game without the perspective. And now it's really easy for us to reposition this. So we can check this, make sure we've got this ground 
check transform and then we slide it down on this axis and position it at the feet. And now it happened to be that this is two units high and the center is here. So the proper position here is probably minus one to get it exactly on the feet. And don't forget to switch it back as well to perspective if it looks all weird on you. And then you can just hold the Alt key again and rotate. And now this child object now is uh, right at the feet of this capsule. So on the player, we're actually, it still says none here. And that's now it's because we need to assign this one. We need to connect this reference. So I take this game object from the hierarchy and I drag it all the way down here to this exposed field. And then it's got this link now. If I click on this one, it'll highlight it here. So I know that this is now connected. This is also something you'll be doing a lot when you create your game objects. You'll expose things here. Maybe you want a camera follow script and you want to drag the camera reference to it. You could expose, for example, the jump height or the speed that a character can move. You can expose all sorts of things here in the inspector. And instead of having to go back into the code to modify it, you can do it out here. But now we've created this little reference. So let's get back uh, to what we were doing. And so we've got this transform exposed now. So we can use this now. And down here in the fixed update, let's do a check here. If, and then we can access the physics engine directly here, physics. And then we've got this overlap sphere function. And again, I know this because I've uh, created a lot of small, simple prototype games, and I've found that there's so many ways you can do things. You can shoot ray casts to check the distance to the ground. You can do, uh, in this case, overlap sphere or check collisions. There's so many things. And this is just one more the method that you've got at your disposal. So this is expecting something. And uh, we can see here in the little hint here that it's expecting a position. And remember now that the transform that we exposed up there, the ground position, then that actually, that was a transform. So we know that that has a position. So I can check here, ground, check transform. And then this one has, remember it's got position, rotation and scale, but we only need the position here. So position, and that's gonna be the world position comma, and then we have a radius here. So how big should this check be? And we remember that the character's height was two units, the capsule. So maybe we only need to check a little small area down there. So maybe we'll keep it at 0 0.1. Here's another little strange thing. When you type a decimal number in C sharp, you actually need to add F. So those squiggly marks there that was there before, it's because it needed to, to have F to indicate that it's a float number that we want. And then it's still complaining for some reason. Let's complete the code. So why is this not working? We have a ground check transform position, so everything looks right. But if we hover over these red squiggly marks, we can see, okay, it says, cannot implicitly convert type collider brackets to bool. We're trying to check if this is true and it's not actually returning if it's true or not for us. It's returning something called an array of the colliders that it's collided with. So let's say that this overlap sphere was really big checking for an entire world. Maybe it like encompasses uh, four tiles. Then it's actually returning references to all those tiles. And we're only interested to see if it's uh, colliding with anything at all or overlapping anything at all. So we can access the length now of that array. And the length, it will say how many components are we hitting at the moment. And remember, we only want to run this code now if we're connected to the ground or if we're touching the ground. So it means that it has to be at least one collider that it's overlapping with. So let's check if this length, the number of colliders is zero. And if it is zero, it's not colliding with anything that we know that we're probably gonna be in the air. So now we'll do the return here. So we'll check, is this little fictional sphere of ours, that's only 0 0.1 units in radius. If that one is not overlapping with anything, we're gonna assume that we're in the air and we're gonna exit this fixed update. So let's try to press play again. And that's still not working. So why could that be? Well, it's because the capsule collider, it's got a collider itself. So it's actually colliding with itself. And there's multiple ways to fix that. You could uh, use something called layers here, for example. Uh, you could create a new layer and call that one player. And we could have this uh, little overlap sphere ignore that layer. That's one way to do it. So since it's always colliding with its own collider, we could go for the method of saying that, okay, if the collision is only one for this little sphere, then return. And what this is saying now is that uh, I know to expect that I'm always going to be colliding with myself. So I'm going to expect if I'm in the air, it's only going to be colliding with me. If I'm near the ground, it's going to be two collisions because I'm going to overlap my capsule collider and the ground collider. 
So let's press play now and, and have a look. And now it works to jump because it's colliding with two colliders at the moment. This little fictional sphere now that we've got is colliding with the capsule collider. Here in the scene view we can see it's colliding with this green collider here and it's also colliding with this green collider here. So the collision when we're touching the ground is two. The little fictional, because remember now that at this ground check position now, imagine that there's a little fictional sphere about that size now that is checking how many overlaps am I doing. And when we're on the ground, it's two overlaps. When I'm in the air, it's only overlapping this one. Maybe the bet best way to do it would be to separate the player into its own uh, player uh, layer here. So for the sake of completeness, and just to make this video a little bit longer, let's try that method as well, so you can learn that one. Layer filtering is something very useful that you probably want to be using sometime in the future. So let's create a new layer here. We'll uh, click the player here, use the drop down, click add layer, and here let's just call it player. There are a few built in layers here that you can't change, so let's just pick the first available one, which is number eight. And when you define a layer, this is also something I mistake myself on quite often. It doesn't mean that we actually gave this player that layer now. Because when I go back to the player, we only define the name for it. So we have to go back here and then in the inspector, we'll do the drop down and then change it out to number eight. And now it's going to ask us if we want to do the children as well. And yes, we want to change the children. And that basically sets this one to the player as well. So to this layer. So now we've separated this capsule collider now will be colliding on this layer. But, but if we go to edit and go to the project settings, we can see here in the physics, we scroll down a little bit, this player layer has appeared here now and you've got this weird collision matrix. And here you can actually tick in and out which colliders should be colliding with which ones. But I'll leave this one here for now, but know that it exists at least, that you can define which layers should be colliding with which here. But for our case here now, let's go back into our little script and then we want to change this. We don't want to be checking the length now, how many colliders we hit. We want to be using this layer mask name now. And to make it as simple as possible, you could actually type in loads of uh, weird code here to generate your own mask. But to keep it simple, let's just call it uh, player mask. And this one's not defined, so it doesn't know what to do with this word. But remember, we can press control period here and then generate field player, player mask. And then when we scroll up here, we can look that it's an integer here. But let's change this from a number to a layer mask, because that's actually a thing called a layer mask here. And again, we want the length here to be zero, because now it shouldn't really be colliding with anything soon. But we also have to define this player mask. And this one is a private now, and we want to expose this one into our inspector. So let's move it to the top here. Uh, it doesn't really matter where it is, but I like to keep them uh, grouped together. We'll copy this serialized field here. Now we'll tab back here into, and then see, we've got, uh, this one is exposed now called player mask. So let's drop that one down and let's try to click here, player. And let's see if this works. Press play, space, we can still jump in the air. And then it probably means that we did, we thought about it the wrong way. We're actually checking if it's colliding with player and we wanted to check if it's colliding with everything except the player. So let's do everything first on this player mask, and then let's untick player, and then press play. So now we're actually doing it the proper way here as well. We're, we've successfully implemented a, a layer mask instead of expecting that it's going to be collided. The reason why I didn't really want to assume that it was going to collide all, at all times with one collider at least, is because imagine if this player also carried a weapon or something, or maybe it had colliders for its shoes or some armor then it's difficult to know how many colliders should it always be colliding with for it to be assumed to be in the air. And now we could revert our code here back to zero. And it's because we're actually ignoring all the overlap collisions that we did for the player layer. If you don't understand this fully, it's perfectly fine. Don't worry about it. I just happened to show three different methods to solve the same type of problem now or how to address the same problem. And again, there's multiple more as I could have shown, but let's just leave it like this for now. It's long enough as it is probably. But as we did this, uh, I realized that when I'm playing now, it's quite nice to have the control in the air because now when you steer, it's a little bit strange. If I press play again, I think it's quite common in platformers that you should be able to steer in the air. Okay, we shouldn't be able to double jump all the time or triple or quad jump, but at least when we come here, we want to be able to 
change it here. So because what if I want to steer a little bit in the air? Because if I jump here and press side, nothing happens. And if I press, it's just a little bit awkward. So let's leave the movement for the side, side to side movement. Let's make that possible still. So in order to do that, we can just change the order here. Let's control X this line and then move it to the top here. So it's always going to run the side movement script here, the horizontal input script part. So now make sure control S to play to save it and then press play again. And now we should have, yeah, now we have the steering ability in the air again. It's a little bit more platformy this way. I can steer and change my mind here in the gap. Here's our next bug. So bug number three we have to fix. I'm keeping depressed now, depressed. I'm not depressed, but I'm keeping depressed, moving right. <laughs> so the capsule is actually sticking to the wall now. Even if I let go of the key, yeah, it's, it tends to stick a little bit. So we can fix that by, there's something called physics materials as well. And if you can see here in the collider, it's got material, physics material, and it's got nothing here. So let's go back here into the project into our assets folder and let's create something new here. A new folder called Fizz Materials. And they're very different from uh, the other materials that we created. Those were just to render objects. This is gonna tell the physics engine how much friction and bounciness something has. So here, let's right click, create, and let's create a new physics material. And let's call this one, no friction. And here we can see dynamic and static friction. Let's just set those to zero. And then friction combine because it'll take my value of zero. And then if I'm colliding with a tile that has 0 0.6, it'll take the average of that, which is 0 0.3. But we want to change this to minimum because we always wanted to pick the lowest, which is going to be zero in this case. And then we go back to the player here, scroll down to our rigid body, no, to our capsule collider. And now we can drag this no friction physics material onto this one. And that should hopefully address the stickiness problem that we had. Yeah, so now even if I'm moving towards the wall, the friction is going to pick the lowest and it, its own physics material has zero in friction. So it's just going to slide you right off there. Now maybe we want the camera to follow the player. So how do we do that? We've just been working with a static camera. Let's add some more floor tiles first. Uh, I can collapse these a little bit and let's just create a little bit of a level here. So I'll select this object here, the floor tile. Press Control D to duplicate it. Hold the Control key to snap it nicely into segments here. Move it up maybe. Scroll it a bit light. Control D, create another one. Control D, maybe lower that one down again. And now we want the camera to follow the player. Let's press play again here and see. So here, see it's a little bit boring. It wouldn't be so much fun if you just ran off screen and you can't even clear that jump. So maybe we should also increase the jump height a little bit. Let's do that straight away. Let's increase the jump height. Let's put 10 here. So we can make sure that we clear. Okay, that was probably too much. <laughs> so even if we just double the, the number, it actually has more of an impact when it's in the world of physics. So let's put maybe seven. Let's try that again. Making a game is a lot of trial and error. <laughs> so that's pretty good, I think. Let's see if we can make sure that we can make that jump. Yeah, that's good. Okay, but again, what we wanted to do was make the camera move along because you'll quickly run out of screen space here. So let's go back here. You could write a script for that, but I'm gonna make it even simpler than that. Let's just take this camera now. Remember this whole child-parent relationship thing. Let's just drag the camera and make it a child of our player. And everything looks the same, but when we press play now, the camera is actually gonna follow along here with the player because we can see here that the local position of the camera is the same all the time as it was before because the camera in relation to the player is not changing, but it's following this player object and that one is moving. So many times when you're making a platformer, for example, you could get away with just parenting the camera onto the player object. But then saying that, sometimes you want to do this entirely by script instead. So there's multiple ways to do it, but we'll stick with this one for now. If you wanted to offset the camera a little bit higher up, you could uh, press stop first of all, go to the camera, put Y to zero, Press play again, and now it's a bit more centered there. Let's continue with this uh, level. It's just Control D. Let's make a little overpass here as well. So, Control D, Control D, Control D, Control D, Control D. So 
you can make your level this way and then start creating some new prefabs for new floor tiles maybe. Let's see if this is completable. Let's press play again. Let's see, we can get under here, yeah, that's good. Oh, that one's impossible to make. So uh, you can't have a level where you can't clear the gap. So maybe it would have been good to give a little bit of a ledge there so you can actually come clear and jump it there. Let's collect some coins as well. But in our case, it's not gonna look like coins. It's gonna look more like white Pac-Man pills, but the mechanic will be pretty much the same as coins. Let's right click here in our hierarchy and create um, a new 3D objects and this slime and this slime. And this time, let's just create a little sphere. And that threw it into this position for whatever reason. Let's reset that one back to zero, zero, zero. And then hold the control key and slide it up to maybe there. And that's one big Pac-Man pill. So we don't really want to <laughs> have that size. So let's resize it. Maybe 0 0.2 is good. Yeah, that could be, that'd be all right. We could even create a new material for this one. So let's go to the materials folder, right click, create new material. And let's call this one uh, coin and then make it yellow. Here we could also do, instead of just making this, if we make this yellow here, see it's, oh yeah, we have to actually drag the material onto the coin itself, even though it doesn't look like a coin. But we've got a little dot here now, a yellow dot, but see that it's still applying shadow to it. You could uh, do this, you could tick emission here and do yellow. So you could play around with that a little bit as well to get the look that you want. So it nearly looks like a coin now, even though it's a ball but let's just leave it like that for now. Maybe we move it a little bit to the side here so you don't collect the coin straight away. And then we'll also rename it here so it's not called sphere, let's call it coin. And we should also move it into this uh, level so we can hide it away because it's really part of a level, this coin. But it's still visible here and, and uh, everything like that. And remember that we created layers before and that will come in really handy again. In the layer here, let's do add another layer and let's call this one coin. And then we'll go back to our little coin game object. And remember, we have to change this layer here again to coin. And now this is on a separate layer here, but it still looks pretty much the same. I can control D this one, move it to here. Control D, let's put one in the air up here. Hold the control key to snap it. Control D again, let's put it here. Okay, so what would happen if we press play now? Let's try. So I come running here and then Oh, I bump into the coins. I don't really collect them, but they're more like uh, part of the level. So to fix that, what we could do is uh, we select the coin here and we want to change the collider here to a trigger instead. It's trigger. And now we didn't use the power of prefabs, unfortunately. See, so that's why we should have really done this as prefabs instead. And you should try to do that as early on, because what I'll do now is I'll delete these. And then I'll select this one again, and let's make this one a prefab. So we go to the project folder here, prefabs, and then drag this coin into the prefabs. And now we've created a prefab out of it. Now the prefab already has the correct layer here, the coin layer. So now when we duplicate this one, it's gonna be, uh, all of these will have the coin layer onto them. So what we changed here, which was really important, is we set it to is trigger instead. And that basically tells the physics engine that it should register a collision, but it shouldn't make a, a physical interaction between those objects. So it still won't collect them, but at least it's, they're not stopping me. And in the code now, we can detect this trigger. Remember that we did on collision enter before? There's another one that's very related to that one, another mono behavior called on trigger enter. And if I press tab, it'll auto complete it here. <laughs> and it'll say collider other. And this is actually the collider that we're colliding with. And remember that this player component is running on our player. So the other collider in this case will be the trigger that we're colliding with. And that's gonna be the coin trigger. But still nothing is really happening yet in the code here. So we need to check the layer of what we've just entered the trigger of now. And to do that, we do if other, which is the other collider now, but we actually need to reference the game object that that collider belongs to. So we can type game object here and press tab. And then we want to check the layer of that game object. So it's everything is like basically a hierarchy of things that you can traverse up and down. So we press tab there. Okay, which layer number was it? Because this is a number. If we hover here, we see that it int it says, which is an integer. And that's a whole number, like one, two, three, four, five. And if we alt tab back here, we can see that the layer coin here is number nine. So we can do if layer is nine equals equals, remember the double equal sign. 
open and close squiggly brackets. So if it is nine here, what should we do? Let's just destroy the coin. Destroy other, but remember other is a collider. So we need to reference the game object. We want to destroy the game object. Game object, control S. So now we're saying, okay, I've, I've entered the trigger of a collider and the collider we can access by this other variable or parameter. And then we have here, if the other collider, and then we reference the parent game object that that collider is belonging to, and then we're looking at the layer of that game object, if that equals nine, then we should destroy the other game object. It's very important to have other dot game object, because if I just wrote <laughs> game object here, I'll destroy myself. And now you can see that we're actually collecting these coins now. And here you could start adding stuff like adding a score, for example. Maybe it's not, uh, maybe you want to have a coin collecting and uh, stuff like that you can just put here and uh, have a, a variable increasing. Every time you destroy a coin, could collect it, maybe uh, get a, a point, a score. But instead of adding a scorekeeper now, let's try to do something different. Uh, so maybe we'll give the player a super jump every time he collects a coin. So let's define a new variable up here. And this time it's going to be an int, an integer, which is a whole number, like one, two, three, four, five. And let's call that one super jumps remaining. And by default, this will have a value of zero because we're not initializing with it anything. So it's going to be zero in the beginning. So here, when we have the on trigger enter and we've checked here that we're colliding with a the coin, then we can do not only do we destroy the coin object, but we also do super. And remember, you can press tab and then we'll do plus plus and that's a strange thing as well but that means increment by one you could also uh, have written plus equals one that's also a way to do it and if you wanted to increase it by two for example then you'd give it two super jumps this way so let's just give it one for now so super jumps remaining plus plus means that we're incrementing this value by one and then we can actually use this value here so when we're doing the jump check here let's see jump key was pressed we've got something adding here then we can actually define a little temporary variable here. And you can do that in here straight in, in this method. You can type float jump power equals, let's default this one to five. And you don't really have to type this F here if you don't want to. It's only if you type a decimal point like 5.2, for example, that you need the F. So we could just set it to five now, but internally it'll actually write it 5F. Let's just keep it at 5F. And then what we'll do is if super jumps remaining is greater than zero and here we'll do jump power <laughs> and here we'll do jump power times equals two and that will take the jump power and multiply it by two and then we also have to do super jumps remaining minus minus which is a way to reduce it by one so what's happening now if we press the key it's uh, setting, always setting the jump power by default to five, but if we have any super jumps, <laughs> it'll double the jump power, and then it'll decrease the number of super jumps that we have remaining. And we also have to replace this number down here to jump power, because we had it to a fixed value of seven before, but now it's actually gonna be back to five, so it's not gonna be able to clear that, those height jumps. But if we have a super jump power, then we can do it. So let's go back to the game and press play. Let's move, jump, clear. And now when I jump, I should have a lot more power. And every time I collect one of these coins, I'll have that super power. And here we should be able to clear it. So now instead of adding a score counter, which you could have also done, we've actually given the player some uh, super jump powers. I should also mention that uh, for the overlap sphere, there is actually one called check sphere as well. And uh, that will return a bool that we already know, true or false. But I wanted to show you this uh, overlap sphere as well, because it's quite common that you want to access uh, what, which colliders you're colliding with. And with, the, with this overlap sphere, you have access to those. But theoretically, you could have done a check sphere here as well, which would return a true or a false. To continue the level, you could just keep selecting these tiles, pressing Control D to move them. I usually hold the Control key to get this nice snapping feature. And you can also block select by just click and dragging here, and then press Control D to duplicate the whole block and move them up and down. And I press Control S to save this scene and I collect, collapse this level and I can collapse this one as well. And in the root here, we've just got a, quite a nice tidy hierarchy. Now we've got the level and we've got the player. 
And then we could, if, again, if we wanted to duplicate these uh, coins, control D, make sure we put a super jump here. Control D, we'd need to put one here. And then you want to play test your level to make sure that you can actually complete the levels as well. Okay, we're going to finish off now. This was a very detailed video that produced a really horrible looking game, if you could even call it a game. But that's beside the point a little bit, because what you've gained now, hopefully, is a foundation that you can build upon. I'm hoping that it's given you a little bit of a confidence how you can navigate in the UI, what the different things do, what a game object is, what a transform is, and even how to create your first c -sharp script. And hopefully that won't scare you off too much. There's so many more things I wanted to cover, and I'm going to build a lot more Unity tutorials, but this one is going to be the most basic Unity tutorial I will ever make. I often get the question, how did I get started with Unity, and how did I learn how to make games? And this is exactly how I started. I started with something really, really primitive, and then I built on that. I asked myself questions over and over again. I ask myself a lot of can I questions. Can I create a simple capsule that represents a player? Can I add gravity and make him jump? Can I uh, make him move left to right? Can I add more objects for the level? Can I model the objects in Blender instead to make them look nicer? Can I add some impact effects when uh, the player lands? And can I make some sort of a suspension bridge by connecting joints? And can I model a character instead? And can I make the character walk through a walk animation? And can I improve that animation and actually make a, a run animation instead? Can I model some weapons and put them in sand? Maybe a sword and a shield? Or can I model a gun and have him shoot? Maybe even in the direction that he's aiming. Can I add some sound effects maybe to make it sound like he's shooting? Can I switch to a two-handed weapon, maybe a shotgun? Can I switch to a laser weapon that maybe ricochets the bullets when it hits something? Can I switch to a minigun to make uh, a lot more bullets fly all over the place? Can I have him aim over ledge it and have it pointing down? Can I make a grenade launcher maybe that fires stuff that will explode and send some shockwaves? Can I add a background, maybe like a gradient sky? And can I add more details to the background, maybe like yeah, mountains? And can I have some sort of a parallax effect by including more layers of backgrounds? Can I add a waterfall, maybe a low poly style one? Can I add some clouds? Can I even add some uh, cities in the background or spaceships? Can I add some uh, blurry effect by applying some post-processing? Can I add some smoke or dust where uh, he runs? And can I even add uh, maybe some lighting effects when he shoots, like uh, a muzzle flash? Can I have some impact effects as well, where the bullets hit, maybe? And can I add some objects that he can actually hit? Maybe uh, in the future I can also add some power-ups that he can collect. Can I make a reload effect? Can I make a, a ragdoll out of him if he dies, maybe? So ask yourself the question, can I, and take it from there. Behind all of these can I questions are hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of hours of Googling, trial and error, prototyping, looking in the documentation, looking at YouTube videos, doing more trial and error, YouTubing, you name it. Just that's how I learn. I just repeat it over and over again, and I learn little by little over time. In a similar way to this, I actually learned how to use Blender about five years ago. I started by trying to modify the default cube, and by now I can actually do about 10 cars in 10 minutes like in this video, or I can do five rigged characters in 10 minutes as well. And that's just from practicing over and over and iterating and getting better over time. So if you want to make games in Unity, my advice is start extremely simple, allow it to look terrible, Repeat and iterate time over time, and do the same thing over and over again and improve, and have patience. And I also have to say that I think it's really important that you enjoy making games. If you find this to be quite boring, tedious, or if you want to just uh, put it away and do something else, then it's going to be quite a struggle. But if you enjoy it, if you enjoy making small steps, a little bit of progress, and seeing what you can do next, 
then you're on a great track. I think you're gonna do just fine making games. Hit the thumbs up button if you like this video and don't forget to subscribe if you want to see some more game dev stuff about Unity, Blender, 3D, low poly, you name it. I've also got a Patreon page if you want to drop by and give that little bit of extra support if you can. And check out the description for some merch as well. I've got some t-shirts and hoodies and stuff like that. Until next time, have a great one and I'll see you then.